we're, uh, I guess we have two more weeks of class by my count after today. Um, so there'll be a new syllabus that will explain what we're doing for the last four classes. Um, but I can tell you what that will be now. So Monday, we'll deal with liquidating distributions. Um, so we've been focusing on situations where the partner, distributee partner, it remains a partner, um, at least to some extent, um, which we call continuing or non-liquidating or operating distributions. And then we, uh, on Monday, we'll deal with liquidating distributions, which is where the distributee partner has a no interest in the partnership after the dis distribution. And some of that will be review because it's similar uh, and there'll be a few things that are different. Uh, and then we'll close the book, if you will, in terms of what I would test you on. Then on Wednesday, uh, a week from today, I'll use that to sort of tie up some loose ends. There's some things that we didn't go over that are worth mentioning. For example, we didn't really, we didn't talk about what, what about when you get a partnership interest for services. Um, so we'll talk about that. We'll talk about a few other things that won't be directly tested on the exam. Um, but again, it's useful to pay attention because it's going to be relevant stuff, you know, and picking this stuff up uh, out because it's particularly relevant, even though we didn't cover it. And also there, uh, there's often going to be some um, interaction with stuff we did learn. So it's a good review um, to uh, pay attention to that. But when, any new material on Wednesday, a week from today, won't be covered on the exam. Then the following week, our last week of class, uh, we meet Monday and Wednesday. Well, I'll use Monday to do a review of the course. Um, and then Wednesday, we'll go over um, either um, a prior exam, which I'll post, or some prior exam questions that I've picked out, which I'll post as well. So I think by the end of this week, by Friday, in the business on Friday, I should have the uh, still final installment of the syllabus up, and I should have those sample exam stuff up as well. Um, so, uh, somebody might have a question about whether this class is graded on a curve. So there, the mandatory curve does not apply because we're below the num the threshold, the minimum threshold. And I, I understand that um, students that generally take this class tend to have done well in the basic tax course. Um, and so I take that into account in my grading. You know, I would tend not to depart very significantly from the curve. I would usually grade, you know, certainly on the high end if I stay with the curve um, or a little bit above, but um, I'm not bound by the curve. Um, so if everyone hits it out of the park, uh, I could give everyone A's. That, that has never happened, but um, it could happen. Um, okay, so with that, any questions on any of that? I'll be around also, so folks sometimes, so again, you have complete flexibility when to take the exam. Um, I'll be around during the exam period, at least around um, virtually, if you will. So if uh, you have questions as you study, you can email me, we can set up a time to call, we can set up a time to Zoom. Um, and I don't have like a, you know, I'll, I'll talk to you right before you start taking the exam. So the only, the only way I won't talk to you is if you're actually taking the exam at the time, and I'll assume if you're asking me questions, you're not taking the exam at that time. But other than that, you know, and, and as long as I'm, and I'm usually sort of around normal waking hours. So um, that, uh, so you don't have to worry about the reach, when to reach out to me. Any questions on any of this? All right, well, let's go back to the materials. So just to contextualize ourselves, let's turn to the code. Let's turn to section 731. And just to reiterate where we are, 731 and 732 provide the general rules for distributions, the default rules. If there's no special rule that applies, then these rules apply. And these rules are generally very taxpayer friendly uh, because they tell you, you do not recognize when you have a distribution, when you receive a distribution, you generally don't recognize gain 
except to the extent you receive money in excess of your outside basis. Um, so if you receive only property, non-cash property, then you will never recognize gain under the general rules because you receive no money. So therefore you can't receive money in excess of your outside basis. Um, and we know that the partnership doesn't recognize any gain. Um, and so that's the general rule. And, and that is different than corporate tax, corporations, C corporations. If you're a shareholder of a C corporation and you receive a distribution, um, typically that distribution will be tax, it will be a dividend and subject to tax. So big difference between sub K and sub S. Um, in addition, 731B, which provides no gain or loss recognized by the partnership, that's completely different than in this corporate world where if you a corporation distributes appreciated property, property with a built-in gain, what uh, that built-in gain is going to be recognized by the corporation, the resulting gross income at the time. Um, that's a big, that's a huge difference. So the idea that you can get property into a partnership very extremely easily, we saw section 721, no gain uh, or loss, and then you can get property out without gain. That's a big difference from the, uh, from the corporate world, where with corporations, you can get property in, but they're subject to some uh, more, much more stringent conditions in 721. There are basically no conditions for 721. And then to get property out through a distribution, if it's appreciated property, is going to trigger immediate taxation. And then 732, so those are getting very favorable rules. If you're interested in moving property in and out of an entity, uh, corp uh, partnerships are really um, much better than corporations. It's one reason, but not the only, why you would why you see real estate have real estate heavy enterprises inevitably in partnership form as opposed to corporations, S corps or C corps. Seven thirty two. The basis rules is just the corollary to that. Well, if we're not going to recognize the gain now. And we got to build it in to the property and we generally have this carryover basis regime that we talked about. Um, so those are the general rules and we, uh, and we have, there are really three exceptions. Um, one we've already talked about, which is disguised sale 707A2 cap B. And that's where, well, the contribution and the distribution are not really contributions and distributions. Um, they're disguised sales. Um, really the partner and the contributor is cashing out of some or all of the property and using a partnership to do it. Um, and what's the hallmark or what, what in terms of issue spotting, what do you want to look at? It's that two year rule. Um, if the contributor of property receives a cash distribution within two years, then you generally have that um, rebuttable presumption that it's a disguised sale. I say generally because we have those safe harbors for guaranteed payments, et cetera. Um, but that's really uh, the two year rule is, it does a lot of work there. Um, and if you're outside the two years and you have a re rebuttable presumption, that's not a disguised sale. And the IRS has the burden to clearly establish otherwise, which would be difficult to do. You know, two years is a lot of time, but again, you could construct fact patterns, perhaps where you could rebut that. But in general, practitioners focus a lot on that two year presumption. So that's one exception. Uh, the second exception we're going to cover today, which are the mixing bowl rules. And this relates back to our good friend 704C. So if you remember, um, when you contribute, let's say, appreciated property to a partnership, under 721, you don't recognize gain. So the gain isn't recognized now, but under the basis rules, 722 and 723, 
that built-in gain is preserved in the base, the inside basis that the partnership has in the property under 723. And it's preserved in your own outside basis in the partnership interest under section 722. So that tells us that, you know, 721, 722, and 723 operate together to say, okay, um, gain is deferred, uh, not eliminated. 704C then says, however, in addition, that gain is going to be taxed back to the contributor partner. We're going to allocate that built-in gain back to the contributor partner. Um, and it has to be allocated that way. That's a must. 704C is it's required for that built-in gain to be allocated. Now we saw with 704C methods, traditional, traditional with curative, remedial, that doesn't always work perfectly. Um, and it's okay for there to be some rough edges. Um, but that's that's the way it works. And we spent a lot of time in 704C and we how it works and how it may, you know, not work perfectly, but um, how to do it under the three methods. And that those um, <clears throat> those uh, 704C works, you know, pretty well, but there are a couple of conditions for it to work well. Um, one, I think is more intuitive than the other. One is that the property, the 704C property has to stay in the partnership or be disposed of by the partnership in a taxable transaction. Because if it's distributed, let's say to another partner, that um, won't, that distribution doesn't trigger gain under the general rules. And now that property has flown the coop, it's out. So now you can no longer apply the 704C rules because the 704C property is gone. Now, if it's gone because it's sold or exchanged in a taxable transaction, well, that's not a problem because we deal with it then. Um, you know, by the way, if we do a like kind, if the partnership does a like kind exchange, then as you might intuit, the new property, like kind exchange is tax free with carryover basis under section 1031. Well, you might intuit the replacement property is becomes a 704C property. It steps into the shoes. So that's not a problem either. But if it's distributed to another partner, that property has gone. There's no replacement property and we can no longer apply 704C. Everybody understand that? So that's what, so we have to have the property stay in until it's sold or disposed of. Uh, the second uh, problem would be where the part, the contributor partner leaves. What if the contributor partner um, is distributed property in a liquidating distribution? Well, now we can't apply 7 even, even though the 704C property stays, the 704C partner is gone and we can't tax it back to that partner. So these two exceptions, which we'll call one, again, I said there are three exceptions, but we can group these together. The second uh, exception as the mixing bowl rules. The mixing bowl rules, a property is going in by one partner and out to another partner um, are, reviewed, are considered uh, mixing bowl rules by this tax bar. So we'll call them that as well. And the first one is found in 704C1 cap B. So let's turn to 704C. Remember our good friend 704, I mean, right? I mean, we get 70, we're kind of filling in the loop here. 704A says you allocate tax items according to the partnership agreement. 704B says, however, um, if the partnership agreement doesn't say anything or if the allocation doesn't have substantial economic effect, you allocate in accordance with PIP. And then we know the 704B regs that we've covered in detail, deal with that. 704C1 cap A is the rule that says that we have to um, deal with contributed property um, in the way to take account of the difference between the book and tax. Um, and that's the 704C rules we learned traditional 
curative, remedial. 704C1 cap B is a new rule. We haven't seen that yet. 704C1 cap C deals with built-in losses, contribution built-in losses. I told you, talk briefly about that. I told you I won't, I won't test you on that, but it's uh, a rules if you're dealing with uh, contributions of built-in loss property, um, it effectively puts folks on the remedial method um, and it prevents the, sort of um, some of the rough edges of the traditional and traditional with curative method from presenting themselves in the loss context, loss property, but we're going to focus on gain property. So 7 over C1 cap B, that's what we're covering now. That's mixing bowl rule number one. And we have um, an if uh, then rule. Um, and the if is pretty simple. Um, if any property so contributed, and we're talking about property contributed um, by a partner that has a basis different than its fair market value. So a book tax difference. If you contribute property that has exactly the same fair market value as your basis, like if I buy Microsoft stock right now and I immediately contribute to the partnership, there will be no book tax difference because whatever I paid for it is gonna be my basis. But typically with property, it's gonna go up or down in value. Its basis is not gonna be the same as fair market value. So you have property that's contributed with a book tax difference is then distributed by the partnership other than to the contributing partner. Now, if it goes back to me, so if the contributor gets the property back, no harm, no foul. Uh, we're gonna end up taking the property back with the same carryover basis and it's all gonna be good. But if we contribute to somebody else within seven years of being contributed. So there's your trigger. Partner contributes property and within seven years, that property is distributed to another partner. Then we've got an, a departure from the general rule of non-recognition. So what are the effects? We have three effects. The contributing partner shall be treated recognizing gain or loss from the sale of such property in an amount equal to the gain or loss, which would have been allocated to such partner under 704 C1 cap A by reason of its book tax difference if it had been sold at its fair market value at the time of the distribution. So we, have, we say, okay, we're gonna treat it as if the property were sold instead of distributed. And we're gonna see how much gain um, is going to be recognized by the contributing partner under that assumption. And again, we need to know the fair market value, hypothetical sale for fair market value. And then the character of that gain is gonna be determined by reference to character of the property. So if it's long, if it's a capital asset held for more than a year that's being distributed, then it's going to be long-term capital gain to the contributing partner. And then three little lies says appropriate adjustments shall be made to the adjusted basis of the contributing partner's interest in the partnership. So we're going to adjust the outside basis of the contributing partner. And if it's gain, which is what we're going to be focusing on here, then that means the outside basis of the contributing partner goes up by the amount of that gain. That makes sense. They're being taxed on income. So that gives you basis. Gives you more outside basis. In addition, you're going to increase the adjusted basis of the property distributed, the inside basis of the property distributed to reflect any gain. And that's going to be done immediately before the distribution takes effect. So again, that's very abstract. So let's use a problem to explore. So this is the problem on page 366. Here, uh, very simple fact pattern. A, B, and C are contributing properties. They each have a fair market value of 10. A's is highly appreciated, spaces is only two. B's is appreciated, but not as much, basis is five. And C is one of those situations where there is no appreciation or depreciation. 
the property has exactly the same fair market value as the basis. And so, we can construct the balance sheet. So, yeah, go back to first principles. There's no gain recognized to anyone under 721. They're distributing this property. I'm sorry, contributing the property. Um, under 722, A's outside basis is the basis of the property contributed, which is two. B's outside basis is the base of property he contributed, which is five. C's outside basis is the base of property he contributed. Their capital accounts, their book capital accounts is the fair market value of the property contributed, which in all cases is 10. Here we have a partnership without any debt and um, we're not going to hit the zero negative bait, negative tax capital account. So this is also our tax capital account for those just to remember tax capital account. It's just like your book capital account, except you're going to use the basis of property contributed. And where there's a book tax difference, you use your tax items as opposed to your book items. On the left side of the balance sheet, we've got property number one with a book value of 10 and inside basis of two. Property number two has a book value of 10 and inside basis of five. And property number three And there's our balance sheet. Okay, any questions on that? It's a review. All right, in A, we don't have a distribution, we just have a sale. So what if A were sold for 10 by the partnership? Well, this is classic 704C. If A were sold for 10, I'm sorry, one, sorry, property number one was sold for 10. Then we go through our steps and uh, we would calculate our book and tax items. Our amount realizes 10, our book value is 10. So we have zero book gain. Our amount realizes 10, our tax basis is two. We have eight of tax gain. So zero book gain, eight of tax gain allocate the book gain to the, to the partners for the contributing non-contributing partners B and C is non-contributing with respect to number one give them tax gain equal to book gain easy to do here whatever is left goes to contributing partner a. A is tax on eight. That makes sense. That was the eight of appreciation. They got a capital account credit, but he hadn't been taxed because he just contributed it. Now it's being sold. So now deferral is no longer allowed. Once you sell property, the jig is up. So A is tax on eight. A's outside basis goes up by eight. And that's 704C and it works well. Again, whether we use whether we're using curative or remedial or traditional, we don't have we don't, it's the same answer because we don't have a ceiling rule problem. So we don't have to go to the fifth step. But in whether the regardless. So we this is going to be the same answer under all three methods, 704C methods. Okay. So nothing really surprising there, but that's the rule. That's the result. Okay, any questions on that, on A? 
Okay, in B, now instead we're going to distribute property number one to C. Well, let's pretend for a second that 704C1 cap B weren't in the code. And that'll help us to understand why we need why it's there. So 704C1, uh, 704C1 cap B weren't in the code. Um, and we're distributing it six years later. Um, that we um, we then we don't have a disguised sale issue with regard to C. I mean C is contributing property, and then six years later getting back other property. Um, besides, it wouldn't make any sense for C to engage in a disguised sale because he's no guy no built in gain. But six years is plenty of time. It's outside. You know, you're in the rebuttal that it's not a sale or exchange, and six years is a, is an awful long period of time. So 707A2 cap B isn't implicated here. But if we, so apply the other, uh, the general rule, if we distribute that property, I mean, no gain to anybody. Property number one gets distributed to C. We don't have to book up or book down property number one because it's still worth 10. And we have to, we'd have to book it up or down if property number one is not worth 10, but uh, we're gonna reduce C's capital count by 10. And um, if this were a liquidating distribution um, where C is just going out and going away, which it seems like it would be in this case, then we're gonna see that C, uh, instead of taking a basis of two, C would take a basis of 10 in the property. Um, so uh, it reduces outside basis by 10, the basis he takes in the property. That's not really as important, just to realize that now this property is gone. It hasn't been taxed. And so now when C sells a property, there's no way to attribute it back to A. I mean, in theory, you could envision a system that says, okay, we're gonna continue this and say, okay, C, as long as C holds number one, we won't tax A, it's still sort of held by the partners even though it's not in the partnership. I mean, you'd have some abuse potential there, but even if you wanted to do that, think about how the information reporting you'd have to have. You'd have to have C report to A when C sells the property. Um, and then that would trigger then tax consequences to A. We could do that with a partnership in which A is, and C are, A is a partner, but it's imagine it'd be difficult, if not impossible to do it, to extend this beyond. And so, If we were to not have 704C1 cap B, then we would basically uh, be tethering the relationship between A and the property without truing up the, the built-in gain. Now, eventually A is gonna get taxed on that A, like if, everything were sold and cash were distributed, A, we get taxed on that. So that just shows us that even without 704C, we've shown this that eventually down the road, when the partner's interest is liquidated, it, there will be a true up. But again, that, that can be problematic. Number one, because liquidation of interest could happen many, many, many years in the, in the future. Uh, number two, the character, this may be ordinary and well, the, distribution, the liquidating gain to A would be capital. Um, and then finally A could die and heirs get a stepped up basis and that goes away. And so there are, um, you know, that's not the way Congress wants partnership to work to sort of say, okay, we'll true it up at the end. We want to true it up when number one is sold. When number one is no longer sold, it's distributed. And so that's what would happen without 704C1 cap B. So that um, that relationship would then be broken and A would have a true up only if and when A liquidates her interest. Okay, any questions on that? All right, well, how does 704C1 cap B actually work? Well, it says, okay, we have a distribution of property 
that A contributed, distributed to another partner within seven years. So it then says, okay, how much gain, tax gain, would A realize, recognize, if number one, instead of being distributed, had been sold? Well, we already established that, it's eight. So A would be have eight of gain, That would increase A's outside basis by eight. And it also increases number one's outside basis by eight. And then when the property is distributed, so that, that hypothetical sale and adjustments to basis occurs right before the distribution now the distribution occurs and C, capital account is reduced by the fair market value of property distributed. And now whether it's liquidating or non-liquidating, C's basis in number one is gonna be 10. So reduce C's outside basis by 10. So going back to the problem, the answer is the same as A for A, C, we can add C's consequences. C is going to receive the property with a fair market value and basis of 10 and C's capital account and outside basis will be reduced to zero. Even if C remains a partner. Okay, any questions on that? All right, in C, we shoot property number three to A, to number three to A. So um, first thing to note here is that when we go number three to A, so we do have a contribution of property by C that's being distributed to another partner. within seven years. And so 704 C1 cap B technically applies to C. Um, but because C's, um, because C's property has no book tax difference, there is no 704 C gain. If we were to sell the property for fair market value, there's neither book nor tax gain. And so under 704 C1 cap B, there would be no effect. So this doesn't, it, 704 C1 cap B isn't the focus of this problem. The focus of this problem is now the fact that A, and let's assume this is a liquidating distribution to A. So where A is going out. Um, under the uh, general rule, again, let's assume the special mixing bowl rule I'm going to talk about in a second doesn't apply. Without a special rule, what would happen then would be A's book capital accounts reduced by 10, the fair market value. Um, under the liquidating distribution rules, we're gonna see that in this case, the um, 
A's would take a basis in number three equal to its outside basis. So you reduce it by two. And so there would be zero, zero. Again, A is a liquidating, is a liquidating distribution. And A takes number three. Fair market value of 10 and adjust the basis of two. And really, if you think about it, A has undergone an exchange of property number one for property number three and swapped basis. So the gain didn't evaporate, but he, he was able to do a tax free swap. Now, in some cases, the tax law allows you to do a tax-free swap, uh, where you have real estate that is of like kind, and you meet other conditions, 1031 allows you to do a tax-free swap. But that's the exception that proves the rule. When you exchange one property for another, that's typically a taxable event. And so here, by allowing A to receive property number three in a tax-free way, um, a has affected a tax-free swap. And so 737, the second part of the mixing bowl rules applies to deal with this context, okay? So, so this is not what would happen, but this is what would happen if 737 didn't apply, wasn't around, or if this happened eight years. So if it happened or seven years in a day, then this would be the result after the A's contribution. But under the facts, it happened six years, so we have to apply 737. So let's turn to section 737. Okay, 737A, in the case of any distribution by a partnership to a partner, so here we have a distribution of property number three to partner A. Such partner, so it's the distributee partner, that's A, shall be treated as recognizing gain in amount equal to the lesser of the two following uh, numbers. So, one is the excess of the fair market value of property received in the distribution. So that's 10. That's the fair market value of, number of property three is 10 over the, the outside basis of the partner, which is two. So that's eight. Uh, we reduce the outside basis by the amount of any money received in the same distribution. There's no money received by A. So one is eight. Um, and that's just the difference between, again, the fair market value and the outside basis. Um, and then two is the net pre-contribution gain of the partner. And that tends to do the work here. NPC is defined here. Purpose of this section NPC means the net gain, which would have been recognized by the distributee partner under 704C1 cap B, if all the property which had been contributed to the partnership by the distributee partner within seven years of the distribution and remains held by the partnership is, has been distributed to another partner. Now that's kind of a confusing thing to like say, okay, we're gonna kick you into 704, we're gonna, we're gonna assume it was your property that you contributed that is still in the partnership is distributed to another partner. And then that rule, 704C1 cap B then says, okay, we're gonna assume it's been sold for fair market value instead of distributed. Again, basically we're, we're gonna say, okay, all of A's property, which she contributed within seven years, that's prop and is still held by the partnership, that's property number one. We're gonna treat that as being sold by the by A, I'm sorry, by the partnership. And so, and then we have the correlative 
basis adjustment. So perhaps why that kicks us in the 704C1 cap B is just, it's easier to sort of kick you there instead of having to restate all the impacts. But it triggers a hypothetical sale of the property that A contributed. So we say, okay, treat A, uh, property number one is being sold. How much gain under 704 is going to be allocated to A? That would be A. A reports A of gain. Um, increases A's outside basis. Well, actually, the, the code section does that. So um, 737, says A recognizes A of gain. What else happens? Seven thirty seven C says the outside basis of uh, the distributee partners shall be increased by amount of any gain. So we're going to increase A's outside basis by eight to ten, and that outside basis is deemed to occur immediately before the distribution. And then we're also going to adjust the inside basis of the contributed property. So 737C1 says we increase A's outside basis. So 737A says A taxed on eight of gain. 737C1 says increase A's outside basis. 737C2 says increase A's, increase the partnership's inside basis in, the, in property number one. Once we've done that, now we do the distribution, which is distributing property number three to A. So reduce A's capital count by the fair market value. And then that property will take a basis of 10 in number three. So A takes number three with fair market value of 10 and adjust the basis of 10. And then A's capital count and outside basis is gonna be zero. So it prevents, you know, the partner from leaving the coop without having to pay the 704C deferred tax. Any questions on that? And again, this really is only a problem technically if A, um, if A, if this is a liquidating distribution, because again, now A is gone. And so if you still have this built-in gain here, you couldn't tax A on the gain because A is no longer a partner. So it's kind of weird that the code applies this. The 737 applies whether it's liquidating or non-liquidating. If A remains a partner, we're still going to be able to get him back that eight. Um, so that's kind of weird. So, and I guess 737 is sort of overbroad in that way. Um, and perhaps a trap for the unwary, because if you're thinking carefully, you might say there's nothing, there's no abuse here. A is still liable. But regardless, 737 applies to all, all distributions, whether liquidating or not. And again, what's the trigger? The trigger is going to be where a partner contributed property and within seven years is distributed other property. Money is not a problem because money, if uh, A would just been distributed money, then A is going to have uh, gain when A gets distributed money because it's 
the money is in excess of an outside basis. So that's why the code focuses on 737. If you only receive money, then the excess of the fair market value of property other than money is zero. So 737A1 would be zero. So you wouldn't have any 737 um, gain. So it's, it's when uh, the, the contributing partner receives other property, non-cash property within seven years. of his contribution. Okay, any questions on that? Okay, uh, and then we get to D. So in D, we're distributing property number two, which was contributed by B, we're distributing that to A. So this is where you have 704C1 cap B applies and 737 applies. So, Let's clean this up. Start over. So we're distributing number uh, two to A. So 704C1 cap B applies to B because B's property, which he contributed, is within seven years being distributed to A. So 704C1 cap B says, okay, we're gonna hypothesize a sale of property number two by the partnership. What if property number two were sold by the partnership? Well, we have a sale of 704C property. Calculate the book gain and the tax gain. Book gain is zero, tax gain is five. Allocate the book gain, zero, zero, zero. Allocate the tax gain, zero and zero to A and C. A and C are the non contributing partners with respect to property number two. Whatever's left is the five of tax gain, all goes to B. B is taxed on five of tax gain under 704C. So B has five of gain. Assuming two is a capital asset held by the partnership for more than a year and to, to get to cap, tack the holding period held by B, then this would be a long-term capital gain. We increase B's outside basis by the five of gain. We increase property number two's basis by five of gain. So that's 704C1 cap B because these properties being distributed to another partner within seven years. A is exposed to 737. With A, A has contributed property and, uh, and been distributed other property, other non-cash property within seven years. So we have to go to 737 and we have that calculation, which we did before. So A recognizes gain 
the excess of the fair market value of property number two, which is 10, over A's outside basis, which is two, that's eight, the net pre-contribution gain is the amount of gain under 704C1 cap B if A, if property number one, uh, number one, which A had contributed, had been distributed to another partner. If that's the case, we would hypothesize a sale of property number one for fair market value and figure out how much 704C gain goes to A, and that would be eight. So A has eight of gain under 737 A. We increase A's outside basis by eight under 737 C1. We increase the partnership's inside basis of A's property by eight. Under 737C2. And then after we've done that, we can then distribute the property or take account of the distribution of property, reduce A's capital account by the fair market value of property number two. A is going to take a basis of property number two of 10 to reduce A's outside basis by 10. So A takes property number two. with fair market value of 10 and a basis of 10. So big difference than distribution to tax free, right? Uh, this distribution uh, triggered a bunch of gain for B uh, who didn't even receive a distribution, right? And that's where the counterintuitiveness may come in, um, right? Where B is kind of like, well, wait a second, I didn't receive a distribution. That's B paying the piper for this book tax disparity because B's property is flying the coop within seven years. A is receiving a distribution um, and taxed on his built-in gain because A is his own liquidating distribution is leaving the coop. Okay, so that problem D is a situation where both are triggered, both mixing ball rules are triggered at the same time because we have a distribution of property contributed by one partner being distributed to another partner who contributed property. Appreciated property. Recognize that if we distributed property number two to C, then a 737 is going to come in and not tax C because C's net pre contribution gain is zero, right? And so it's C is not really, a, C is like a cash contributor in that respect because he's got no book tax difference. Can I ask a question? Yep. So, we either, we take the lesser out of fair market value minus adjusted basis or the partner's pre-contribution gain. Right, well, right? Uh, the excess, so I, um, I go right back to the code because, you know, it's hard, you know, I, I can, so I think when you get good at, really good at this stuff, you can sort of conceptualize what the issue is, but then you just got to go to the code um, because if you don't, you just, you know, you screw it up. Um, so it's the excess. So in 737A1, it's the excess, if any. So that means you're putting A over B. And so A is going to be the fair market value of property other than money received. So that's going to be 10. Okay. 
all right? And then you're gonna put that over the uh, outside basis of the partner committed for the distribution reduced by any cash re uh, received in the distribution. Well, we received no cash in the distribution. But that's a, if they had received cash as well of one, let's say, then B would be not, B would be one because his outside basis is two, but we have zero cash received. So it's 10 over two, that's eight. So our 737A1 number is eight and our 737A2 number is also eight here. Did that answer your question? Yeah, I was starting to think that both would always lead to the same answer, but that's just because of the numbers we have in this problem. Right, we, we, this, we've kept this kind of simple, but yeah, you can imagine if, if, um, if A receives cash and there's other complications that can, that can occur. Um, uh, yeah, if A is receiving um, cash uh, that can substantially impact this, because again, the, the top number is fair market value of property other than money. Other questions? Um, okay, back to the problem set. So um, in E, now we have a sale one year after, a distribution of property two one year after to A. So A contributes property number one and then within a year receives property number two. So the technical, technically, the disguised sale rule trumps the mixing bowl rules. So in terms of the ordering rule, if the disguised sale rule applies, then you apply that rule as opposed to these rules. In general, the rules are going to come to the same answer. So it's kind of an academic question. Um, whether the disguised sale rule applies here or not depends on um, the relationship between the contribution and distribution, rather the but-for relationship and the uh, entrepreneurial risk question. And again, we have the presumption that it is a disguised sale because it's within one year. Um, but it's really academic because if it's a disguised sale, um, you treat it as uh, A is just selling property number one uh, to the partnership for property number two, it's a taxable exchange and uh, A would be taxed on the gain um, of eight. And so, uh, and if you somehow escape 707A2 cap B, then you're into 704, um, 737, sorry, 737. So I don't really, we don't have to worry about E. Um, let's focus on A through D, or A is really review. So the new stuff is B, C, and D. Let's focus on that. D E, the point is, is that if you do have competition between uh, 707A2 cap B and the mixing bowl rules, yeah, then the disguised sale rule would technically trump, but it would give you the same answer. But here, you're sort of out of the frying pan into the fryer. If you somehow escape 707A2 cap B, you're back into um, 737 and 704C1 cap B for, for B. So don't worry uh, so much at all about E. About F, you have this weird rule situation. What if six years after formation, you distribute property number one to B, so that's A's property to B, and then B's property to A, it occurs simultaneous, and you do it six years after, and the properties are like kind. Like kind exchanges of real property um, are um, if you meet certain conditions under 1031 are tax-free. So here it's kind of weird because what you could have done is you could have distributed property number one back to A and then distributed property number two back to B and then they could have swapped tax-free. So the, the end result is the same as if they distribute the property back to the contributor and then the contributors each swap their property. And if it's of like kind, it would be a tax-free swap. So a rule 704C2 applies here, which would give the taxpayers the same result as if 
they had been distributed their own property and then swapped in a like kind exchange. And so you have this sort of exception to the rule where the parties could have rejiggered the transaction quite easily and avoided a gain. So don't worry about F either. And don't worry about G. The G, the point is, is that this rule 704C2 doesn't apply similarly in the 737 context. So it's just kind of a weird anomaly. But again, let's focus here on B, C, and D. Let's make sure we understand those rules the best. And the other ones you don't have to worry about. Okay, any questions on that? All right, let me just mention one other thing before we go, which is that, so you may recall that we, we can have book tax differences that are created by contributions of property like we have here, um, where A contributed property with a fair market value of 10 and a basis of two to create that book tax difference. Uh, because the book value is 10 and the inside basis is two. And that's, uh, uh, we, you can refer to that as uh, forward 704C issues, where it's created by contributions. We have a book tax disparity created by contributions. We also learned that you could have reverse 704C issues. So let's take a simple example. Let's say A and B each contribute 10 of cash partnership takes that cash of 20 and buys property and call it land, Make clear it's non-depreciable property. So buys land for 20. And because it's purchased property, there's no book tax difference, it's purchased for 20. And then the land goes up in value to 100. So we have 80 of appreciation, it goes up to 100. And C says, comes in and says, you know what? I'll contribute 50 of cash into this partnership and take a one third interest. Because the land is worth 100, I'll put in 50, that's 150 divided by three is 50. So it's a good deal, it's a fair deal. And A and B agree to that. And we said in that case where you have a, a, a new partner contributing cash or property or will services, whatever, a new partner contributing stuff for a partnership interest that you would typically book up the properties of the partnership to fair market value before the new partner comes in, give the gain, the book gain to the par existing partners here, they've agreed to share it 50-50. And then you would admit C. Now you got cash as well up here. And we talked about how this creates book tax difference. And this is what we called reverse 704C issues. Reverse 704C. And, but we said that 704C applies equally. We, and we also said it's as if A and B each owned half the land individually and contributed, contributed their halves to a new partnership with C who contributed 50 of cash. It's the same transaction. And 704, you know, you have the same issues with regard to the land. Now when the land is sold, you have to figure out how to allocate, you know, you the five, the four or five step approach by using traditional remedial, whatever. Here's where the difference comes in. 
these rules, we, these mixing bowl rules. So one question would be, well, okay, is the land now a mixing bowl issue? Is it treated as if A and B contributed the land and now within seven years, if that land gets distributed to another partner or if A and B receive property, are they then subject to these rules? And the answer is no. That 704 C1 Cap B and 737 only apply to the, what we what tax lawyers refer to as the forward 704 C layer. Layers that are created by contributions of property, not by revaluations. So if that land were, you know, if we were then to distribute half the land to C within seven years, that would not trigger 704 C1 cap B for A or B, even though conceptually it should, it doesn't. And one reason why is it just becomes awfully complicated to do that. Um, you can imagine a situation where you have new part, you know, then D comes in and E comes in. You you have your you have these different layers of reverse seven hundred four C gain, and then you also are sort of starting the clock again each time. Uh, so it becomes immensely complicated. So we only apply these fixing bowl rules where we get actual contribution of property instead of the sort of deemed contribution from revaluations or. Another way to say that we only apply it to the forward 704C layer and not any reverse 704C layers. Um, okay, and again, that's not gonna be on the test. I'm not gonna test you on that, um, but you should be aware of that sort of dichotomy. And it's a good review of reverse 704C. There will very likely be some reverse 704C on the exam. Uh, given how significant it is. And we just went over it again in another simple fact pattern. So questions on that? Okay, before I let you go, I'm gonna talk just very briefly about the third. We I said there are three exceptions to the general rule that distributions are tax-free. I guess there's really four. Um, one would be the cash distribution in excess of outside basis um, in 731A1. Um, two is disguised sale. Again, you're looking at distributions, contributions of property and distributions of cash within a two year period. Three are these mixing bowl rules where you're looking at contributions of property and then uh, distributions of that contributed property within seven years or distributions of property to the contributing partner within seven years. And then the last one, which thankfully we're not gonna go over any detail is 751B. So 751B is a mess. We've seen 751A, as you recall. 751A would deal with when we have sale of a partnership interest. We said that the seller is going, and if the partnership has hot assets, then the seller is going to recognize uh, some gain or loss that's going to be ordinary. Um, and we said you hypothesize the sale, the hot assets, and allocate the resulting ordinary income or loss. That's 71A, and that's really simple. You know, we've covered that. That's I, as I mentioned that that's really like the easiest stuff for the class. It's important, comes up all the time, but it's really pretty straightforward as far as the stuff we do. 71B, and it was concerned about a situation where. I could have a bunch of hot asset gain in my partnership. That's really my gain. And then I sell it to a third party and I've sort of, without 71A, I've gotten rid of my ordinary income exposure. And I've given it to my transferee and the transferee may not care. The transferee may not be a taxpayer, uh, may have NOLs. Um, and so we worry about that. Well, 71B is the same sort of worry, which is that, instead of being if selling my interest where I have big hot asset gain, I could receive distributions of property that alters my interest in ordinary income assets. So I could be distributed cash in liquidation, or I can be distributed a capital asset. And it, it could be either liquidating my interest or partially liquidating or 
we can distribute, um, do a pro rata distribution of property where one partner gets all the hot assets, the other partner gets all the cold assets, right? And you've thereby altered their interests in ordinary assets and capital assets under the general rules that we've discovered, that we've covered. You could very easily shift people's interest in hot assets versus cold using distributions. So 71B deals with, with these sort of disproportionate distributions where partners are altering their interest. And it's a really significant problem to, to try to fix. And the way the current rules work is it creates hypothetical sales and exchanges um, that are inordinately complicated. I used to cover this. The problem is it's so complex and it's so late in the semester and I'm not that much of a, a sadist to test on it. So it was really just frustrating. So now all I do is I mention it exists and the trigger is gonna be, we have distributions that alter partners' interests in hot assets or cold assets. And if it, you do have a distribution like that, then you gotta deal with 751. I, uh, I'm sorry if I feel bad that you do have to deal with it. Um, I guess the good news is you get to bill a lot of time because it's not easy, um, but um, it's a mess and the rule applies. And uh, again, I'm not gonna test you on that, but you should be aware that the rule exists. The other thing I'll just point out is that there is a subtle difference between hot assets for 71B purposes and 71A purposes. 751A just refers to the unrealized receivables and inventory items. 751B for a hot asset is unrealized receivables or inventory items which have appreciated substantially in value. So if you, have in, if you only have inventory items that have not substantially appreciated, then you don't have any hot assets and therefore you don't have any possible alteration. What is a, a, appreciated substantially in value? That's defined down here to mean fair market value exceeds 120% of the adjusted basis. So one easy out for where anyway, you don't have to worry about 751 is if you have only inventory, not unrealized receivables, and your inventory is has a fair market value less than 120% of basis, then you get to ignore, you get to a basis 751 won't apply because all your assets will be deemed to be cold and therefore you can't have disproportionate distributions. But um, that's the final sort of exception to the rule. And so again, in practice, when you're out there and you're dealing with a distribution, you know, you got to jump through, uh, make sure all of these exceptions of the rule don't apply. And then once you conclude that, then you can give your opinion to the client that the tax, the distribution won't be taxable. That's a good answer if you, if you can come to it. Okay, any questions on any of that? Or anything else on distributions, operating distribution? Okay, so the next class, look for the syllabus, updated syllabus. Um, the next class, we'll talk about liquidating distributions. That kind of ties everything up. Um, and uh, then again, we close the book for exam purposes uh, once uh, after class on Monday. Okay, any questions? All right, I'll see everybody um, next week. Bye-bye.